All right, shalom, y'all. Uh, this is Hael again with uh, chapter two to the lesson on melanin, right? I like to start by saying, call halal Yahweh Bashem Shai. That's all praises be unto the Most High God, Yahweh, in the name of his son, Yahweh Shai. So uh, the last site that we were at basically just went over some of the uh, the basics regarding melanin, what it does and where it's found, right? But um, actually, I thought this was on a completely different site, but it's right here. It's uh, a list of a bunch of different um, melanin-related diseases. Uh, and when I say melanin, as in the chemical, I'm really uh, talking about the sources that they come from, right? Um, so, and those sources change depending on where they're located and the stage of development of one's body. So, say if you're pre-embryonic, like basically you're in the first stages of basically conception and developing as a baby, you would be in the melanoblast phase, right? And you've got all types of stuff like Warmberg syndrome, right? We go look at this. Right, look at this, look at this, man. Look at this. See, Esau tries to, to, to glamorize some of these diseases. See, and some of us, every once and again, we get some of these diseases too, because these are curses. See what I'm saying? And there's no guarantee that this is a Negro. This could be a this could be a Hamite. Right? But we see what this disease does. Warmberg syndrome is a group of genetic conditions that can cause hearing loss and changes in coloring, pigmentation of the hair, skin, and eyes. Although most people with Warmberg syndrome have normal hearing, moderate to profound hearing loss can occur in one or both ears. Right. Now, this is just some symptoms that they know about of Warmberg syndrome. Cleft lip. Right. Always want to get a visual um, representation of a concept that we're talking about. So that's a cleft lip or cleft palate. Not too alluring, right? Constipation, we know what that is. Deafness, we know what that is. Extremely pale blue eyes or colors that don't match. What a lot of people don't understand about pale eyes is that pale eyes are actually the most susceptible to damage from UV light. So on average, if you have pale colored eyes, you're going to have worse vision than somebody who has darkly colored eyes. That, that's why this world, again, these are little signs and symbols that the world is upside down, that truly uh, an unfit to rule oppressor is in charge because they extol the virtues of weakness and they call strength weakness, all right? The, 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 the reason why we're able to have stronger muscles is because we have stronger bones. The reason why we're... We're able to even have all those things is because we have melanin protecting us from the sunlight and also using that sunlight uh, to, you know, stimulate vitamin D pro uh, production. Um, all types of other processes are aided by melanin. Um, I mean, it's just that's why at every turn they have to vilify our natural features. They have to attempt to call it dark and ugly and and and. Uh, what was it? Um, I was reading this one. Um, it was an excerpt from a book and it was talking about how the Negroid face was intrinsically stupid just by how it's designed. The thick lips and the wide nose and, and you know, the broad features and almond shaped eyes. You know, it, it, it called us intrinsically dumb looking. But then you look at the source that it's coming from and then you begin to understand. Right. But. And these are just some of the things, right? But we're going to move on. That's just one disease, right? Vitiligo. Anybody who's familiar with uh, boondocks, you know what vitiligo is. <laughs> Uncle Ruckus, right? <laughs> got re vitiligo. But, um, oh man, that brother got it bad. You know, but this is something that in, in biblical terms, you would associate with leprosy, right? As a matter of fact, all right, we're going to start at 29. So this is going to be uh, Leviticus 13 and 29. If a man or a woman have a plague upon the head or the beard, then the priest shall see the plague, and behold, 
if it be in sight deeper than the skin, and there be in it a yellow thin hair, so blonde hair, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a dry scowl, even a leprosy upon the head or beard. Now, it goes on to say, you know, if the priest looks at it and it's different, you know, like uh, not deeper than skin, um, there's no yellow hair or stuff like that. But this is leprosy, according to the Bible, right? Now, you would wonder why when uh, Miriam, actually, you know, we're going to bring that up. We're going to bring that up. Leprous. Leprous. So we're going to go ahead and start at verse 9. So this is Numbers 12 and 9. And the anger of the Most High God was kindled against them. So keep in mind, the Most High God is angry. He's angry. And he departed. So the Most High got angry and left. But before he left, he did something. And the cloud departed off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. So I wonder, what was the response to her being leprous? Right? What was that response? Was it like, oh, thank God that she's, you know, a lily white, white woman now, and we proud of her and every man want to get at her? Was that the response of Israel? Hmm, I wonder. Let's see. Verse 11, and Aaron said unto Moses, alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead. Wait, I thought being lily white and pale skin was very beautiful. Not according to the Bible, right? Leprosy is nothing to play with, too. See, back then, they didn't have SPF 50 to rub down on yourself if you was pale skin. You would have to walk around completely covered up, looking like a leper. <laughs> that, that's why the trope of the leper having the, the overhanging cowl or, you know, cloak on, covering every visible part of their skin up from sun exposure, that's very real. And if you live in an area such as Israel and you're fair-skinned, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to be getting burnt up all the time. That's how we also know they're not the real people, right? Revelations 2 and 9. But this is the response from Aaron. He's like, yo, what, what, what? Like, oh my God, she, she's as one dead. I'm going to finish reading verse 12. Let her not be as one dead of whom the, the flesh is half consumed when he come or cometh out of his mother's womb. Now, wait a minute. What does he mean by this? Right? Let her not be as one dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. Hmm. Who came out of their mother's womb with pale skin? So pale that the blood showed forth through his skin and was actually called wasted away as he. Hmm, I wonder who that is. Esau. Right? So Matt, they, this was so alarming that they were like, yo, don't don't leave her like an Edomite. Don't make her like that. See, at this point, the Edomites were already a people. Actually, it's locked here. It's locked here. It's locked here. No, no, no. They weren't a people yet. They weren't a people yet. Wait. Yeah, yeah. They were a people. It's locked here. I'm all mixed up. I just had to think about that for a second. Just had to think it through. But at this point, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had already lived. So Esau had lived as well. That's why this statement is made, right, in verse 12. Because this is alluding to Esau. Don't let her be like that. Right? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Most High God said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received again. 
So they beg to the Most High God to not leave her in that condition because literally she was counted as one dead in terms of her appearance. Leprosy is no joke. And if you look at them people over in, in Africa, mainland Africa, who have albinism, they are not having a good time over there. I mean, not only do you have a bunch of superstitions and, and idolatrous practices where they kill those people for, you know, like their body parts and their blood and stuff like that, thinking that, you know, it has uh, magical significance. But those people are constantly at horrible risk of sun exposure and having all types of issues as a result of it. Leprosy is no joke, man. But again, this is how you know that the, the, the 12 and 16. So this is how you know that this is true, right? Hebrews 12 and 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. What does profane mean? All right. Relating or devoted to that which is not sacred or biblical, secular rather than religious. Ain't that Esau? Ain't that Esau? Of a person or their behavior, not respectful or of orthodox religion, religious practice, irrelevant. Oh, I'm sorry, not irrelevant. Irreverent. Irreverent. Salakia, y'all. And then the verb, treat with irreverence or disrespect. So who's the group of people on the planet who loudly and proudly proclaims that there is no God? And then not only do they proclaim there's no God, they begin to desecrate the creation of God and his children openly and proudly, so much so that they invite all the other heathens of the world to come and join in. That's Esau, y'all. And not only do they desecrate us through physical actions and physical means, but they even uh, sling dirt and mud on our reputation and our likeness. But let's go ahead and move on with this. We're going to list a few more diseases and then we're going to move on, okay? So this is in the melanocytes, right? The, the, the uh, melanocytes in the skin, all right? Now, you've got the melanosomes, right? That's the substructures within the melanocytes. We went over that in the last chapter, right? So we have the degradation of that through a disease, and it produces an actual syndrome. Chidiac Higashi syndrome is a rare inherited complex immune disorder that usually occurs in childhood, characterized by reduced pigment in the skin and eyes. Immune deficiency with an increased susceptibility to infections and a tendency to bruise and bleed easily. Well, damn, like, so not only are you more um, um, immunocompromised and susceptible to disease, but you're also less resilient to punishment in general, whether it be, you know, kinetic or physical punishment being hit by things or just simply having a disease or, you know, any type of infection. It, this is all this one substance having a problem in the body or the mechanism by which the substance is produced having a problem. And it gives rise to all these different diseases, right? And you'll notice a pattern with all these diseases. You see pale faces and you see this many eyes. Boy, that's how all of them look to me. But anyway, and you see it in our people too, in ham, and in certain uh, organs of the body, right? This boy has very, very blue eyes as a result. But you see this brother here? You could tell by the, the, the kinky hair that that's what that is, right? Now, let's be real. You think this brother likes having this affliction on him? See, this, these are the things that our people don't stop and consider when we see sicknesses being laid on our people by the Most High God. See, this is a very grievous judgment. For what? I'm not certain. 
But this brother has to suffer it. If he's still here on this planet, I guarantee he still look like this because this is not something that is treatable. This is not something that is reversible. The only way that this can be fixed is it is through the intervention of the Most High God. But let's move on. This is um, basically an issue with the, the chemical process, which gives rise to the production of melanin, right? So phenylketonuria, phenylketonuria, an autosomal recessive disease characterized by intellectual disability, epilepsy, <laughs> fair blonde hair and blue eyes, and other skin changes. Results from a deficiency of the phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme. The pigmentary changes are due to competitive inhibition of tyrosinase by phenylalanine buildup. Okay, so it goes into a bit, you know, I, I just want to pull up the disease, right? So like it said, the buildup of phenylalanine. But look at this. Look at this. Look at this. He don't look too bright, y'all. And I, I'm not I'm not bagging on him. I'm just saying you can see something's off, right? Now, I'ma scroll down just for dramatic effect. I'm gonna keep going. You see him right there. Right? That looked like ham, but it could be us. Who knows? But you'll notice most of these pictures of people that, according to the pictures, have this disease. I don't know if she got it because it like she's melanated. But a lot of these people where you can tell that something's off, something very common about them. You see the skin hue? It's Esau. Right? Esau is the main group of people who suffer from this affliction. I spelled despise wrong, but it's fine. <laughs> no, I spelled it right. I spelled it right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I did. So Obadiah 1 and 2. So Obadiah 1 and 2. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Now, go back to verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Most High God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Most High God, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. So this message is to the Edomites. When the Bible proclaims that the Most High has made them small among the heathen, has he not done so? They're the smallest population of people on the planet as a nation. They're the smallest. That's why they go to great lengths to unify and then break everybody else up. So it makes them appear larger. But even with all that done, they're still the smallest. Right. Thou art greatly despised. I'm going to tell you something. If I had to live out my life like this. Let me bring up a good picture here. If I had to live out my life like homeboy here and I had enough cognitive ability to contemplate whether God loved me or not, I'd be leaning toward the latter. Right. Because why else would he make me like this? Right. Did God make this person like this? OK. Now, this is in relation to Jeremiah, of course, but the most high kills and makes alive. Right. So the issues of life and death are his. Jeremiah one and five. Behold, I formed thee in the belly. I knew thee. Or before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, that's applicable to the Israelites, but it's also applicable to the heathens in way in by way of he formed all of us in the belly. Right? He knew all of us before he formed us in the belly, before he caused us to be conceived. 
for the most high guides the steps of men. Uh, ah, what is it? What is it? No, that's that's not what I want. That's not what I want. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. actually, that might be it. Nope, nope, that's not it. Salakia, y'all. I thought I had it. It was on the tip of my mind. I can't remember. Mm. But we see that the Most High God has, has judgments for those who he's, he deems fit, right? Whether it's for something you did in this life or something in your past life or the sins of your fathers, the Most High has his reasons for judgment and he exercises his freedom to conduct judgment. Nothing we can do or say about it. And that's just one disease that you can get through just having an issue with your body producing melanin, right? Another disease. Voight Koyanagi Harada syndrome. You see the, the dark splotches and then I'm sorry, the dark skin, and then the light splotches. And then you see the discoloration in the eyes. This discoloration of the eyes is also associated with blindness, right? But it not only affects the skin and the eyes, let's read this. Voight Koyanagi Harada disease is a rare disorder of unknown origin that affects many body systems, including as the eyes, ears, skin, and the covering of the brain and spinal cord, the meninges, right? The most noticeable symptom is a rapid loss of vision. I'm telling you, like the most high God gave us something so special that without it, other systems of the body don't work properly. And that's if you ain't just, I'm trying to be good. Because I want this to go up on YouTube. I ain't going to say all that stuff I want to say. <laughs> well, I was about to use that R word. But, and then you have dopaminergic neurons. So Parkinson's disease, a neurodegenerative condition characterized by progressive postural and gait difficulties, results from dropout of neuromelanin-producing dop dopaminergic neurons in the brain. So depigmentation of the substantia nigra now, they cloak how they name things in different languages, in different vernacular that you have to be familiar with, right? All this means is black substance, right? The substantia nigra is a region in the midbrain that is considered part of the basal ganglia. Additionally, the substantia nigra itself is made up of two anatomically and functionally distinct portions. The substantia nigra pars compacta, we mentioned that in the last video, and the substantia nigris pars reticu reticulata. We didn't mention that, right? But we're going to go to a little image here, so we'll have an idea in the brain where it's at. You see this one right here on the bottom? It's at the base of the brain right there. Right. Notice it's deep in the brain and it's near the pineal gland. And it's, it's also near something called the corpus callosum. Right. Uh, so your brain has two hemispheres. The corpus callosum is a very dense and fibrous uh, structure that facilitates intercommunication within the brain itself. Right. But you got to think if you have structures that are surrounding that vital highway system between hemispheres. If it's damaged, you can only imagine the implications for the rest of the brain, right? That's why when it says that Parkinson's disease, ah.
And it says that Parkinson's disease is a disorder of the central nervous system that affects movement, often including tremors. When it says things like that, you have to, you can only imagine all the systems that are in the brain that are suffering dysfunction as a result of just this one degradation in, in, in a system that will concerning its neuromelanin content, right? It, it, it has all these implications, but yet it's just, it's one thing that's not working right, right? And it's, it's a neurodegenerative condition, just to read it again, characterized by progressive postural and gait difficulties, results from dropout of neuromelanin producing dopaminergic neurons, right? So those melanated structures having issues with them, right? Whether they just be deteriorating, damaged, whatever, being attacked by your own immune system, stuff like that can happen. The, the people who suffer these afflictions, such as Parkinson's disease, they, it, it is a relatively hopeless decline because the, the, the element in their body that is suffering degradation is so integral to the function of brain health. That's why, again, I'm going into some depth regarding melanin because it is very important that we understand what melanin does and we appreciate and give thanks to the Most High God for giving it to us. All right. Now, so in around 2019, actually, Salakia, y'all. Hmm. Just mucusy, y'all. I'm so sorry. But around 2019, there was a discovery made um, in the, not necessarily in the manufacturing of melanin because our melanin can't be replicated, right? They've synthesized eumelanin um, in, in um, I'll just say it the way it is, in vitro, uh, meaning like in a test tube or in a culture. But the thing that they can't do is they cannot get the spin values of the electrons that are basically in the atoms or in the molecules of the melanin to basically be identical to ours. Uh, apparently, that matters so much that the effectiveness of synthetic melanin is not even close to the real thing, even though molecularly speaking, they appear to be identical. So the, the, the Most High literally made this stuff so special that they can't copy it. But they found a way to take you melanin whether it, and it's usually sourced or cultured from a natural source, right? They, they allude to taking it from the skin of frogs and all types of other animals, but let's face it, the, the place where you find it the most in terms of its concentration is in the Israelite men and women, um, the most in Judah, Benjamin, and of course, Levi, those who are darkly melanated. But, and actually, before our brethren uh, started intermixing with the Spaniards and, you know, the, the heathen, they were also darkly melanated as well and ran the gamut. That's why um, the Bible says this about Ephraim. So, in relation to Ephraim, Ephraim in Hosea 7 and 8, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. So it's already saying here that Ephraim has mixed himself amongst the heathen, amongst all the people. So he looks like every, well, in terms of, you know, the, the, the skin tones, right? He, he runs the gamut from the lightest browns to the darkest of, of browns, almost black, right? But in relation to the discovery that they made in 2019, they found that melanin could go through a process called annealing in a vacuum. What annealing is, is heat metal or glass and allow it to cool slowly in order to remove internal stresses and toughen it. So let's see, let's see if we can look at a visual representation that shows us the mechanical process of annealing. So melanin is arranged in, um, as we went over in the previous video, 
uh, melanin is comprised of polymers, right? Uh, which means like um, just many, uh, <laughs> many uh, bodies or uh, many molecules. So you have a molecule which is comprised of many atoms or basically different atoms that are bound together. And then those little clumps or those um, aggregations of atoms, which are molecules, bind to other molecules. So now you have many molecules bound together. That's what you see here in this little um, diagram. The annealing process heats melanin in a vacuum, meaning uh, all the air is completely sucked out. Uh, it's almost like to, to emulate um, like uh, spatial conditions, as a matter of fact. A space entirely devoid of matter. So air is matter. And if you take matter out of the air, it too has an effect on whatever matter that you leave in that space that's in a vacuum, right? But while they're heating it in a vacuum, it begins to break down. And these attachments begin to essentially fall apart. And what happens is the melanin goes from being like this crystalline structure and it falls flat. And as a result, its properties change. And the property that's increased is conductivity. Now, why does that matter? All right. Evidence of unprecedented high electronic conductivity in mammalian pigment-based eumelanin. Now, note it says eumelanin, not pheomelanin, not allomelanin, not pyomelanin, not neuromelanin. A very specific type, eumelanin, and that's what we had. Thin films after thermal annealing in vacuum. So, actually, this is the part we do want to read. Melanin denotes a variety of mammalian pigments, including the dark electrically conductive eumelanin and the reddish. Now, notice it says dark electrically conductive eumelanin, and then it says and the reddish sulfur containing pheomelanin. That doesn't mean that pheomelanin is conductive, right? That principle seems to be primarily shared only by eumelanin, at least in the capacity where it can be useful. Right? Organic bioelectronics is showing increasing interest in eumelanin exploitation. Note the word there, exploitation, for biointerfaces. But the low conductivity of the material is limiting the development of eumelanin-based devices. Here, for the first time, we report an abrupt increase of the eumelanin electrical conductivity revealing the highest value presented to date of 318 Siemens per uh, centimeter. So what is a Siemens unit? Per measure. It measures electrical conductance, right? In the case of direct current, the conductance is Siemens in the reciprocal of the resistance in ohms. So in the case of alternating current, it is the reciprocal of the impedance of ohms. Whether it be direct current or alternate, alternating current, the unit of measure for electrical conductance is Siemens, right? Now, here for the first time, we report an abrupt increase of the eumelanin electrical conductivity, revealing the highest value presented to date of 318 Siemens units. So what we want to see is what is a very popular conductive industrial material. Copper, right? Copper conductance per centimeter. So annealed. Is this in Siemens units? It's just one oh okay units. All right, cool. So And I was trying to get it in per centimeter. So, and this is just to take a small aside. Granted, this is an hour, so I don't have a whole, whole lot of time. But you'll notice here that just reading this, 
takes you to the door of electrical engineering. This is something that our people do not give the most high enough credit for. The intricate nature of the body in and of itself. I was talking about this in the previous video concerning the circulatory system. But when you look at the electrical systems of the body, the biochemical systems of the body, and then you see that there is a primary mediator in all those systems that make them all work correctly. And this one material is literally found in one group of people in high concentrations, and it makes them better than everyone else. We don't give the most high enough praise for this. We do not give him enough thanks for him making us special because he could have made us like everybody else. And we would have no salt, no swag, and no flavor. All right. But let's look here, right? Let's see. Oh, copper's right there. All right. Now you're going to notice they don't have melanin on here, right? So, so they got all the different types of electrical conductance in here. Uh, related to silver, uh, to some common materials. But yeah, I'm trying to get it in centimeters. Unfortunately, I, I don't know enough about electrical engineering to do the conversion down to uh, centimeters. Um, but I do know uh, from what I've read that copper... Versus melanin. So it's a half billion times less than copper, according to good old Mr. Esau. Yeah. But when you understand that there are other principles uh, regarding uh, melanin that make it far more alluring for biomedical applications, then you begin to understand the importance of this discovery that they made in 2019, right? And we're going to get a little into that with this one. Um, but we see that it has a relatively high uh, conductance. Okay, let's see what else do we want from here. Nah, that's all we wanted. So we see that melanin plays a integral role in a lot of their research as well. They're, they're trying to find ways to um, make melanin more, um, not only available by in terms of quantity, but they're trying to make it um, more refined in regards to the purpose that they want to apply it to. So electrical conductance, for instance, could is something that's very important when you talk about uh, prosthetics, not just prosthetics that are large uh, in size, like a fake arm or pro I don't want to say fake arm, it's, you know, incendiary, um, a prosthetic arm or a prosthetic leg. Excuse me. But um, melanin can also be used in things like nanobots, right? Um, hold on, my sound machine. Nanobots. Melanin. Now, look what comes up when you search for this, right? Will cyborg circuits be made of melanin? Why is that? That's because melanin doesn't produce a um, basically a, a amino response from the body. All right. So what you can do. Oh, it actually, th this is actually what I really wanted to read, because this is something that is, is very sinister that our oppressors are working on, and that's why they are trying to source us for this, this miraculous substance. And I keep seeing the University of Naples, Federico II. I keep seeing that everywhere I look, so a lot of these studies are being headed up by the same people, right? And they, they're in Italy. But... There we go. Melanins occur 
naturally in virtually all forms of life. They are, are non-toxic and do not elicit an immune reaction, explains Pizella. Out in the environment, they are also completely biodegradable. So, some researchers try to increase the conduct conductivity of eumelanin by combining it with metals or super, superheating it into a graphene-like material. But what they were left are what they were left with was not truly the biocompatible conducting material promised. Determined to find the real deal, the Neapolitan group considered the structure of eumelanin. Now, there's a process that they're working on concerning graphene oxide to be used to transport different materials inside of its structure. What would they be using to transport inside of its structure? The most beneficial chemical on the planet, melanin. But I'm going to get into that. And note, it states that the, 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 they superheated it into a graphene-like material. You know what else is treated with annealing? The heating process in a vacuum? Graphene oxide. What is graphene oxide? All right. I wanted to do this later, but I'm going to do some of it right now. They have something called self-assembling wires made of graphene oxide while applying a current to a liquid substrate that the graphene oxide is in. Substrate just being the water, right? When they apply a current, you're going to notice these little tentacles start to form. And it's reaching out to the edge. And when it hits the edge, what's going to happen is all these ones that haven't touched the edge, they're going to basically stop doing what they're doing. And they're going to basically become a, a substructure within the bigger structure itself to the bigger or the long tentacle that's right here that's touching the edge. Now, do I understand all the implications of this or all the methods behind this? I'm not saying that I do. However, one of the things that you could definitely see on, on the Internet right now is that graphene oxide responds very well to 5G. And graphene oxide is something that is being used in biomedical science alongside melanin. I, Esau has found a way to try to make a desperate bid to take back the blessing by literally trying to make himself into us. But that's neither here nor there, and I know that's more on the theoretical side of things. I just like to stick with Hebrews 12 and 16, lest there be any profane, uh, or lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, right? Because no one is as profane as the so-called white man. And we see the machinations of the white man are wicked and they run deep trying to get this blessing back in every conceivable way that they can. Or if they can't get the blessing back, at least shore up the gap so that they can be like Jake, equal Jake in a physical capacity. So when you look in the body, the Most High God is actually designed mechanisms within the body that actually do similar things to what you just saw with that um, that uh, graphene oxide. In the cell membrane, the cell membrane is basically designed like this. And the membrane basically is the outer uh, skin of the cell that, that encapsulates eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are cells that are nuclei or nucleuses surrounded by a cellular envelope, right? That envelope goes all the way around the cell and its layer is comprised of these little heads that have tails facing inward. And the way that these little heads and tails are electrically charged, they always attract one another, like almost like a zipper, right? So say you cut um, the envelope of a cell, you can have that envelope spontaneously 
come closed due to the electrical charges of the envelope itself. Right? So holes in lipid bilayers, and that's what it's called, it's called a lipid bilayer, can be sealed by several alternative mechanisms, including membrane self-sealing. That's the first one we're going to read. Uh, and that's the only one we really need to read. Reduction in membrane tension to promote self-healing. Patching of hole by vertex fusion of large intracellular vesicles. Inward budding of hole containing membrane area. Outward budding of hole containing membrane area. Or removal of hole containing membrane area by adjacent cell. So even your cells have different ways of healing themselves if they incur damage. Again, we do not give the Most High enough praise for the things that he has set in us. Man, I wish I didn't have to type KGV every time, but that's... Dreams. Again, Psalms 33 and 8. Let all the earth fear the Most High God. Fear the Most High God. I'm afraid of a power who can design all these things in perfect balance and then throw them into disarray at just a simple whim. I fear that. I fear him enough to keep his commandments to the best of my ability. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. When you look at these things that Esau is trying to do, this is not somebody standing in awe of God. This is someone trying to become God. That's what this is. That's why, again, Hebrews 12 and 16 is so applicable to the Edomites. How much time we got? We got 13 minutes. All right, cool. I might have to make a chapter three and then I'll wrap it up on that one. But we have a self-sealing membrane in ourselves. All right. And I'm going to go into a little bit of depth with it. Studies of artificial membranes have shown that ruptured bilayer membranes can seal spontaneously without the need for auxiliary proteins. Gozins and domin, domers, <laughs> dominers. Uh, when a hole is formed in a lipid bilayer, lipid disorder present on the curved edges of the hole provides a driving force for resealing so the edge tension can be minimized. On the other hand, resealing is counteracted by membrane tension, which is low in artificial membranes, but is high in a cellular context where the membrane is attached to rigid components, such as the cytoskeleton or the nuclear lamina. So the cytoskeleton is going to be basically even some of your cells have a skeletal system. I do air quotes. It's what I do. But I do that in this case because the cytoskeleton is often comprised of, of basically uh, free-floating proteins. Um, in the, the, the liquid uh, cyto, what's it called? Uh, basically the body of the cell, right? Um, yes, yeah, cytoplasm. Sorry about that, y'all. Uh, so the cytoplasm, like all this fluid inside of a cell, like that, that lightish pink area, that's the cytoplasm. And what a cell will do is a cell basically will secrete proteins and different organs uh, will form comprising basically a, a, a structure that gives the cell some rigidity, right? So the cell isn't just some blob of liquid that has no definite shape. It's amorphous. Although it's blobular, it still has a more or less definite shape, right? And it, it keeps that shape through those proteins. When that shape is disturbed, Literally, the way the cell is designed, electrical charges on different surfaces of different molecules to reseal itself. The Most High God designed this stuff. That's why the, the more you lean on Esau to tell you about your body, the less he can tell you, the more it becomes conjecture and theory. All right? 
But, and then reduction of membrane tension, meaning like basically making it more slack so it'll draw together, or increasing uh, membrane tension. So, and you got to remember, this is all happening at the cellular level. You don't think about any of this. And um, melanin assists in all these healing, uh, you know, processes by protecting the cell itself from DNA degradation. Because you got to remember, a lot of these processes that are carried out within the cell, they're carried out because the cell has an, an ability to reference its instructional subset of DNA. Right? The DNA literally tells the cell what it can and can't do, when to do it. Like, take your skin cells, for instance. When they reach the, the, the final stage of their life, they undergo something called cellular pop, apoptosis. Cellular apoptosis is cell death that's programmed into a cell. Cells are not meant to live forever. Nothing is meant to live forever. But they do refresh themselves. And once they refresh, what need is there for the old cell to persist? So eventually, that cell literally undergoes cell death or it falls prey to an autophage. Autophagy is the natural conserved degradation of the cell that removes unnecessary or dysfunctional components through a lysosome dependent regulated mechanism. A lysosome is a membrane bound cell organelle that contains digestive enzymes. So what happens is a old cell that's not needed anymore is basically taken by the body if it doesn't undergo programmed cell death. It will be eaten by a phagocyte. Phagocytes are what people know as white blood cells, right? And what it will do is it will eat that cell, it'll break it down, and it'll spit out all the components that could be reused. For instance, a red blood cell has something called hemoglobin on it, and that hemoglobin binds to an iron molecule. And that iron molecule is how those red blood cells attach oxygen to it and transport it around the body. That's why you have so many of them going all around your body, feeding your, your, all your organs, your muscles, your bones, everything oxygen. But when that red blood cell is no longer needed or it's old and ready to basically die, uh, it will be, uh, it will undergo phagocytosis and the, uh, basically the critical parts that could be reused, the elements in the cell, like the iron, will be spat out by the uh, phagocyte and the body will reuse that, that, that mineral or that, that substance. Again, Psalms 33 and 8, the Most High designed all this stuff in balance. That's why looking at something like melanin, the melanin in cells is recycled. All these precious substances are recycled. Your body produces what it needs, and then it conserves what it has. All these redundant systems are operating all at once, all of them. But we're going to go ahead and end on this one, right? Racial difference in cochlear pigmentation is associated with hearing loss risk. Hmm. So the goal of this study, or the goals of this study, are to characterize the distribution of melanin pigmentation in the cochlea. I showed the cochlea in the previous video. It's a horn-like structure in the ear, but in the center of the cochlea, you have melanin. So right in there. Mm -hmm. So actually, let's get the definition so we can explain a little bit. I think we spelled cochlear wrong, but that's fine. So melanocytes are known to be present in the inner ear in results from evolutionary... Okay, whatever. So that uh, article goes a little bit more into it. So 
obviously they know that there's a difference in hearing abilities between peoples, right? People groups, nations, right? The goals of this study are to are to characterize the distribution of melanin pigmentation in the human cochlea and to investigate differences in pigment content between races, right? And they did this by human temporal bone specimens from the John Hopkins temporal bone collection were examined. Demographic, clinical, and audiometric data were analyzed. Melanin pigmentation in the cochlea was quantified in each specimen. Results. 19 African Americans and 27 Caucasian specimens were selected for the study. I thought this was between nation groups. We only got two nations here. Where's Moab? Where's Ammon? Where, where's everybody else? Because that's not important. Esau's trying to figure out how do I become Jake? Why am I not as good as them? Right? The mean ages were 64 and 70 years for African Americans and, and Caucasian specimens, respectively. All right. At all cochlear turns, African American specimens contain significantly more pigmentation in the stria vascularis and Rosenthal's canal compared with Caucasian specimens. Oh. The stria vascularis is part of the lateral wall of the cochlear duct. It is a somewhat stratified epithelium containing primarily three cell types. Marginal cells, which are involved in K transport, are potassium, and the line of endolymphatic cell are space of the scala media. They are connected to basal cells with jap gun or gap junctions. <laughs> I said jap. Oh, come on, YouTube, don't take it down. All right. But again, we see it here. All right? It's in here. All right? So the stria vascularis. Let's see if we can find that on here. Ah, oh, it's back there. Yeah. So hmm. I wonder if the eardrum is located back there. But then the Rosenthal's canal is melanated as well. All right. So the spiral canal of the cochlea. Right? The bony labyrinth. Right, the thing that spirals, that whole structure is melanated. Then when you look at our people and how we produce music, how we're the most melodious people on the planet, how we're the most gifted dancers, so much so that when we move to another country and we sire children with their women and they're raised in another custom, they still yield the artistry within that purview or that 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 constrained custom within that people group. We still yield the trend because we're the most gifted with music. We're the most gifted with dancing. Your ear also controls your, your ability to like be balanced and to move, right? So the ear contributes to balance, the inner ear, right? And these are all structures in the inner ear. Again, like we don't give the most high enough credit and we also don't do enough homework. Because just like Revelations, I believe, 1 and 3 says, blessed is he that read. <laughs> and most of our people do not read. I'm going to end it with this. Revelations 1 and 3, blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. We're at the last days and Jake is still walking around without a damn clue in the world. And all this information is right here online. Absolutely incredible. But I'm going to end it this time by saying, call hello, you how about Shimmy Shai? I'm going to come right back with another video. I'm going to try to wrap up the remaining because I don't want to go too deep. I just wanted this to be about three hours. And then I got to find a way to pay for this damn shit because I got downloaded from uh, <laughs> uh, Vidyar 